Um, so yeah, welcome everyone. I'm Pete Waddingham. I'm a program manager with the Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Science Network. Uh, welcome to this health innovation exchange on virtual reality, augmented reality and mixed reality and its application to healthcare in the NHS. Um, we've got some fantastic speakers lined up for you today. Um, just before we introduce the first of those, um, I, I'm just going to uh, go over a couple of, of, of things, a couple of um, uh, sort of uh, format of the session, etc. But the first thing I wanted to start with is just a massive thank you to everyone. Um, I felt really guilty. I mean, the timing of this event, you know, we've been planning this event for a while now, but obviously, you know, we, we're into a third lockdown and that's having a, an impact on frontline staff, you know, both professionally and personally. And um, uh, so it was just really thank you for giving up your time and, and your commitment to to be part of this event. And um, as I said, the timing might have not been perfect in terms of COVID, but in terms of technology and where the immersion is going, immersive technology, I think the time is right, actually. And 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 you're going to hear from some from some fantastic people today that I really hope prick your ears up and, and, and enthuse you about this topic um, and, and I know many of you are enthusiastic about the topic already just very quickly what is a health innovation exchange and why have we why have we picked to talk about virtual reality and augmented reality so I work for the Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Science Network we're seen as the innovation arm of the NHS so we're, we're involved in lots and lots of different areas um, and, you know, please do follow us on social media because, you know, I, I couldn't do justice today to just the breadth of, of, of the things that we are involved in as an HSM. But one of the things that we do try and do is shine a spotlight on topics. And, and I thought it would be really beneficial to shine a spotlight on virtual reality, augmented reality uh, and mixed reality and its application to health. Um, and actually, I think this event that we've got today, we've had over, you know, nearly 160 people register. We've got 30 guest speakers. I think that shows you that there is something in this topic and, and, and that it is a topic to to explore. I just wanted to make really clear that, you know, for me, it's not just about virtual reality. You know, that we, we do want to talk about different immersive experiences, so augmented reality, because like everything, you know, we need choice in the system. You know, virtual real, reality might not be for everyone, not, nor need it be. Um, so really today we're going to hear from a lot of people about the whole breadth of immersive technology. Just really briefly about the format of today. So we're going to have some guest speakers, uh, then we're going to break out into some theme breakout rooms. I've got some colleagues joining me today to help out with the Pete, I'm really sorry it's me again. You've gone on mute again. Sorry. but thank you for jumping in and telling me that um i think it's just because um i think people are being admitted and then it's putting me on so thank you for jumping in um so yeah um so we've got format is you know guest speakers themed breakout rooms and then back for some guest speakers and then right at the end of the meeting for those that do want to take part in it we're going to do a bit of a, a live test demo of a, of a mock virtual reality room using um, a piece of software called spatial uh, and I'm really pleased that Spatial are joining us today as well um, as part of this event. There is going to be a small opportunity for some Q&As, um, but obviously we've got a packed agenda. So please do add them in the comments. We will follow up with the Q&As um, and, uh, and, and some of the speakers will allow some time for some, some interaction. But, but do bear that in mind. Um, you know, we've got a packed agenda. Um, I mean, this bullet point is, is very relevant to what's happening. Please be sympathetic to the virtual meetings. They're not easy to do, not at this scale. There's always some form of kind of technical hiccup. So if you can, just be pleased, sympathetic with us as we make our way through today. Um, yes, we are recording the session and that recording has already started because there are people that have been in touch with us to say, well, look, we're really sorry we can't join, but we'd love to. So at least we've got an opportunity to be able to share some of the learning today for those that have been unable to join. Um, we're going to follow up the event with a survey, so please let us know areas that have interested you today. You know, is it particular topics, themes that have interested you, want to know more on? Let us know about any potential areas of support. And also let us know about any networks that, that you've created today, because we're really keen to see that happen. And then the final thing I just wanted to say is that, you know, I've never really organised an event that I'm so excited to be part of as well. And um, you know, I, I, I was, um, unfortunately, I couldn't hear Professor Shafi Ahmed when he came to speak at the HSN um, conference, and, and, and he's our first guest speaker, and there's lots of them. So I'm really excited to not only have helped organise this event, but to actually listen and to, to hear some learning. 
So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and introduce you to Professor Shab Shafi Ahmed, consultant surgeon at the Royal London Hospital. And if you just bear with me a second, Shafi, because I'll stop sharing there and then hand over to you. Sure, thank you, Pete. Hopefully you can all hear me and, and see me. Uh, I will share my screen uh, and then I'll get to um, do the presentation. Give me one second. So hopefully you can see my screen now. If you can't, just give me a holler. We can see everything, Shafi. That's working perfectly. Thank you. I'm just going to just get that. And just make sure I can uh, get rid of that and just go to. Hopefully, you can see the whole screen now. Are we good, Pete? We are, yes. Yeah, Great. I can see that. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much for the invitation, uh, both to David and Peter. Thanks for putting on a, this, I think, important topic now. I think it's so relevant. A, a year ago, I would have thought that we were struggling with the future of kind of immersive tech, but the COVID pandemic has really shown us the benefits of remote working and now, of course, this whole world of immersive technology. And it's taken off over the last eight months. We've been inundated the requests of how to utilize this kind of platform in both education and clinical practice. So that's good news, of course. I think to remember, of course, the world we live in, it's not just about virtual reality. What we have to get our heads around is the fact that we're living through this world of convergence, the VR and AR and mixed reality, just components of wider technology kind of um, aspiration that we have, bringing different platforms together, whether it's AI, whether it's looking at the brain interface in the future or mobile 5G, these are all relevant when we think about the benefits of immersive tech. So first thing is nomenclature, and it's gone through so many name changes over the last uh, five or six years since I've been involved in this uh, uh, kind of area. So we'd call it extended reality. And what is it? Of course, on the one hand, you've got augmented reality, which overlays information on a smart glass. On the other side, you've got virtual reality. In the middle, you've got this kind of concept of mixed reality. On the other side, we're looking at the future of holograms and avatars and kind of this virtual way of working and meeting people in this environment. So we'll talk about those over the next 15 minutes or so. First, we'll talk about is augmented reality. And this is a lovely mock-up of perhaps the future of the new um, Apple eyeglass, which has been talked about for a number of years now. Maybe by 2022, we'll see the first iterations. And back in 2012 or 13, we saw the introduction of Google Glass to much fanfare. So this is going to revolutionize. But of course, Google Glass was way before its time because it was just ahead of what the public were expecting from these kind of glasses. And there's a whole number now out there. There's Vuzix, whether it's the NREAR just released from, um, uh, from China and Japan and coming through the market in Europe now. We see many, many devices that are smart, will allow integration into platforms on your mobile phone or on your computer. Let's go back to my story many years ago. Of, of course, I do a lot of teaching at medical school. I was frustrated with the limitations of, of, of teaching in a small environment. I was thinking about global education. How do we teach remotely? And I guess I predicted the future about six, seven years ago. I think we had to be more remote, we had to be more virtual, new technology as the main platform. So this was me back in 2014. Oops, let's go back. Sorry about that. Doing an operation using Google Glass, a live operation of cancer across the globe. So for me, to democratize the access to education, so anyone in the world, using 3G, 4G connection at that time, could log in on their smartphone and be taught by me teaching from the Royal London Hospital. We taught 14,000 people across 118 countries. I even taught this man here, who's John Scully, the ex-CEO of Apple, to do a remote operation using his mobile platform. So it's a demonstration of what could be achieved in the future. We've seen companies now using the AR Core and the AR Kit, both for Android and Apple, using these kind of technologies now to overlay information. And this is a, a great company from Germany, creating educational tools in medicine based on the smartphone using AR. Let's go back to 2015. We decided to put some Google glasses into the ambulance and into the helicopters at the Royal London Hospital. And we did this moulage of the kind of trauma team working away. And so this was really showing that we could do remote real-time learning using wearable technology. Again, we're ahead of its time, but we're saying that this was the opportunity to reduce the golden hour, to get information back to host hospital and prevent further complications. Now we've seen six years later, 
The Dean's group would not see me doing a live operation remotely with assisted or teleproctoring or telementoring. And this was a great example during the pandemic of how you could use augmented reality remotely and teach and train people as necessary. So we've come a long way between, between that being aspirational and now being quite relevant in today's society and, of course, healthcare system. And this was an example of them training now remote robotics using their platform uh, of Proxemi. And now, of course, that's been powered by 5G to make it much more... There, and there yeah. might also be a vein, a bit further lateral. But that's OK. You could just take them where they come. So the comfort of your own home. So that's AR, VR. VR, of course, is where you're immersed into a new environment. I'm sure the uh, people on this um, call have all used VR and experienced the kind of benefits of VR. It's not new, of course. It's been around for a long time. When the first stereoscope came back in 1830, we've seen sequential iteration change over many years. What's happened now, of course, we have powerful computers. Now we have the ability to have high level image and video within a VR environment, and we're moving to more standard devices. Back six years ago, this was not possible. We're now seeing these devices that are actually quite cheap, around about 300 pounds per shot, using the untethered, no, connect to a big computer, they have six degrees of freedom, both motion, eye tracking, allowing really rich, immersive experiences. Now we've seen the benefits of that technology. Let's go back to virtual therapy. Virtual therapy is gonna be great. We're actually using VR to help in medicine, i.e. for various disorders. This was the first example. This was Snow World created about four or five years ago, where they were creating this environment of snow, a cold environment, where you could throw balls, imaginary balls in virtual reality. And they gave it to patients with burns. Obviously, that's a hot environment and people have burns and their symptoms and signs. But actually, if you did that, played around with it, uh, whilst having dressing changes, it showed that you could reduce the analgesia requirements fairly quickly. This was a great example of using VR, immersive technology, 360 kind of CG animation, and using it in therapy. And we've now exploded using it for post-traumatic stress disorders, for anxieties, for phobias, for pain relief. And now we're seeing a whole load of examples of virtual therapy. Two years ago, I thought the future of immersive tech was limited until people think actually virtual therapy is going to be the game changer. I think it is. And here we are. This is Cedar Sinai, my friend um, from there, Brendan Spiegel and uh, Diane Juris from On Comfort in Belgium, have applied VR therapy uh, using um, uh, in, in various uh, areas. And now they've recruited over 60,000 patients across the world in over 100 hospitals. It's showing the benefits of, saying, reducing anxiety and pain during and after medical procedures using VR and clin clinical hypnotherapy. We're now seeing good studies out there showcasing what VR therapy will be in the future. Of course, Farhan's going to speak later, I think, his team around what they're doing with virtual rehabilitation in the UK. Great example of UK uh, innovation at the very heart of virtual therapy. And of course, now we're seeing VR being used for in pregnancy during labor. We can reduce the burden of epidurals and reduce the burden of painkillers by actually using VR therapy. So when you're seeing great examples around the world of what's happening, also we're experiencing from the patient perspective how to live in dementia. And this was a great example about three years ago. We're creating examples of how to understand, live through people's experiences. And now patient education tools are coming in in virtual therapy, which I think is a great idea to improve matters. My own experience, I moved from Google last back in 2014, and two years later, I think, you know what, I'll do the world's first VR operation to democratize surgical education around the globe so people with a, with a cardboard headset uh, and a smartphone can access good quality education around the world. rig allows immersion. People around the world using a low-cost technology, a simple VR headset, actually immerse themselves in operating theatre around the world. So this was using example, really pushed out the first time, way back to 2016, with new technology, so we could democratise education. That operation was watched by 55,000 people in 140 countries. Just showing how simple technology could revolutionise the way we teach the future generation of students and trainees. 
This is my own company, Medical Realities. We're creating, we actually launched the world's first interactive platform about three years ago, looking at how we train the future generation uh, of students and surgical trainees. We recorded the operations of 360 in various theatres around the world, including America, India, Italy, and the UK, of course, and Bangladesh. We put them into a platform. We can literally go through a whole learning uh, exercise using a uh, CG animation, using modules, etc., to basically be taught in a new way. And now we've rolled this out to the medical schools in the UK from 2021 for free, because we know there's a huge requirement of virtual learning. These are the kind of things we've been learning on, how to create this kind of environment. This is the operations, this is a lap coli, where you can interact with hotspots, etc., and then actually have a learning mechanism at the end. And now we're going on to simulation that should practice the operation in real-time simulation in VR. So it's an end-to-end -end piece that we've been working on. We've also been working on OSCEs because obviously we realised that medical student training has been limited. So now we're creating a whole bunch of OSCEs. We have about 30 or 40 of them uh, that have launched. So you can actually download this now and play around and learn how to examine patients and be taught. And maybe in the future, examination will be examined virtually using these kind of platforms. So these are the kind of things we've been thinking about for a number of years and what the experience looks like in VR. We also did some anatomy teaching as well with this and other pathology teaching. In fact, we worked really closely with the pathology lab at Leeds and also with the World Global Health Team. I'm really grateful to the Leeds team for supporting us over the last few years. And they've been amazing, always at the forefront of this kind of immersive technology, of course. And these are the anatomy teaching we've done. Now we've seen we're moving away from more simulation. We've seen also VR in America who launched, who launched their kind of orthopedic training platform with a huge amount of investment from Kaiser Permanente Ventures. And they've launched the real training and proven that actually it benefits with increased in capacity and learning with increased skill sets uh, using VR training. And this is going to be the future, of course, learning. Great to work with Will. Will's there in the bottom right-hand corner. Will Bolton, great friend of mine, but also a very good colleague to work with from you know, Leeds. And Leeds, as I said before, amazing at their, their kind of their drive to bring immersive tech into the UK. And of course, Will's programme in Global Health took us to Sierra Leone. And we supported him and he supported us to create some learning tools for amputations good morning. in Sierra Leone. My name is Dr. Ruth Taylor. I am a doctor, house officer at Connor Hospital. I love this headset because they give me an experience as if I'm in the theater. So hopefully we can do more work going forward and uh, we can push this out more globally. But of course, what's the evidence behind this? This is Jeremy Dalton's work at PwC. So actually there's benefits from VR training. We're seeing an increase in learning much quicker learning, more emotionally connected to the platform and taking less time than the traditional learning platforms we have at the moment. So we're seeing real evidence of, of, of improvement. What are mixed reality? Well, we have really two kind of headsets. One is the HoloLens. HoloLens 2 has just come out, of course, about a year ago, and the Magic Leap. And these are kind of really amazing advanced com computation tools that are allowing you to call it what's called spatial computing to allow you to uh, use mixed reality in these devices. We've seen companies that have, of course, run planned surgery uh, in terms of using overlays of uh, images, CTs, MRIs, and a whole lot of comes out there now doing this kind of things, uh, which will be supporting neurosurgery, spinal surgery, orthopedics, whatever. We're showing that actually in real time you can learn in the environment and perhaps plan the operation with much more precision. This is my this is a friend of mine from Japan called Hollow Eyes, run by Maki Sugimoto. They really took this further forward, trying to overlay information in real time to see whether you could operate with a hollow lens and trying to pinpoint uh, the operation making the organs more visible. Of course, it's a rudimentary, it'll get better and better. And in time, maybe in the future, we have to plan the operation and also during the operation, see what's going on to allow us to not uh, uh, make complications or avoid important structures and take the tumor out, for example, in this case. So that's kind of exciting future. It's not the future, of course, it's today. FDA will approve some of these devices for use. So tomorrow you can get them and actually use it for surgical planning immediately. I showed you that picture earlier of Google Glass in 2014 doing remote um, uh, kind of ambulance work. Here we are. This is um, Vodafone. I'm the ambassador for Vodafone 5G in the UK. And what we're working on at the moment is smart ambulances using mixed reality, relaying information in real time to the base with all the observations, et cetera, in real time, with ultrasound, et cetera. So now you have much more worse experience out in the community in the ambulance. I think um, we'll have a speaker in a short while talking about the mixed reality in education. This is what we did with our medical um, school struggling, of course. Uh, and so what's happened is that sometimes with this staple line by the pancreas, you get leaking of fluid, the pancreatic fluid. And that's what you're seeing on the drain. And the drain helps evacuate it without accumulating it. So what we did here was actually take mixed reality into the me medical school, the big lecture theatre, social distance students coming in, that I was in the uh, opera in the uh, on the ward, going doing a ward round, 
relay information to the um, uh, to the main the lecture theatre where my colleague was doing some mentoring as well. So it was a new experience for students, and we had five sessions already in surgery, and we're rolling out more, and I'm sure we'll hear more of that in a few moments. My other ambition is about being virtual. They come with a virtual surgeon. I've been working out how to. Uh, prevent traveling? How do you become more remote? I've been traveling extensively the last three or four years to over 35 countries, working with governments, etc., to reimagine healthcare of the future. This was me as my avatar back in 2017. When we look at remote, we are now more remote. Telemedicine's come in. It's up by 8,000% utilization around the world. We're seeing changes in the way we manage our patients more remotely. And of course, what I really want to do is transport myself like this, you know, take away some of the pressures of travel and also the pressures of climate control. Um, and how do we manage this going forward? Here we are. This is me using HoloLens. This was back in 2017, but we decided to connect with three avatars and three time zones, three countries together. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, Safi. So, for example, we're using avatars, which is not quite lifelike, polygonal images are blue, not quite realistic. What about actually using holograms? This was me using a process called photogrammetry, creating a real life model of myself using a bit of AI, and then transport myself using 5G. <laughs> Shafi, have a look at this. Yeah, let me have a look over your shoulder. Oh yeah, I see what's going on. So that's 5G using showing how kind of a real high bandwidth, low latency can improve some of the ideas of VR. We did this with other companies just showing that we can take it one step further with mimicking face and movements and eye movements. And this was with a company called hey, Apia. Good to see you again. Hey Harrison, so good to see you. Where are you? I'm in London. Uh, so good to see you. I think we've got Ian here as well, haven't we? Hi, Ian. Hey, guys. I'm in uh, downtown Atlanta right now. Thanks for. So that was using smartphones as well as mixed reality and augmented reality to try and make it much more easier to scope with. And this is obviously an example using spatial. I understand you've got spatial coming up later. Fantastic. We've been using it regularly for business meetings. And in 2021, I'll be teaching in the virtual environment to my medical students, actually, in real time. So we're now planning that from next week. We'll bring students together in these kind of environments. Hey, John, how's California? Hey, Shafi, it's really beautiful here. How's London? London's great. Should we have a virtual handshake? Yes, of course. So the last thing to say, of course, is that thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Hopefully that's given me a glimpse of what the future might hold. But of course, it's not the future, it's reality. It's just that we're now here, and it's a great quote from William Gibson, that the future is already here, we just haven't distributed it fairly at the moment. But that's our job uh, as clinicians and scientists and educationalists to do that further. Thanks very much. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you for that, Shafi. And um, I mean, I was excited to see about this topic before hearing you speak, and and and, and I'm even more so now. It's um, I think I can tell that you've you tried to cram quite a lot in there, and and thank you for doing that because it's important to give people the breadth of of just how you know what what range of of, of tools and and things are out there because there is no one fits solution. So very very kind of you. Thank you for your time and thank you for that overview. And. Um, Let's stick to time because we have got a packed out audience. And 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 Shafi mentioned work that's happening in Leeds, and and I was really keen to try and find some some local contacts. We've got lots of speakers today within the Yorkshire and Humber region. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Dr. Andrew Lewington, consultant renal physician um, at Leeds Teaching Hospital, who's going to just explain a little bit about how they're using the Hololens uh, in training and education. Hi, thank you, Peter. I hope people can hear me. Can you hear me, Peter? We can, yeah. Thank you, Andrew. OK, I'm trying to uh, share my screen now. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's. Um, can you see that little? This. OK, good. Yeah. I'll, I'll keep on your track. So that little share button at the top and then we'll give yeah. you the nod as soon as it's come through. I have clicked on it. click on it again yeah uh, uh hold on this give me a second promising. yeah don't worry good there you excellent. go excellent so hopefully yeah, you can excellent. see that yeah now, i'm not sure if i can bring up the... 
Yeah, give me a sec. Sorry, there's the panels that are coming up that are obscuring the um, the place where I want to bring up the uh, the larger presentation. Give me a second. Just bottom right, I think, on them little icons, if you can see it. Uh, yeah, you're you're just covering it at the moment with your face. That's, That's all right. Um, now, has that worked? Can you see the full slide now? Uh, not the moment, no. To be honest with you, it's not ruining the experience. So uh, if, if you can't, you know, just, just carry on. It's not ruining it. I think we can see that. So. OK. So I need to bring back the slide presentation now. That's um, covered the whole of the screen. Can you see any of the slides at the moment? Yeah, we can see the first can one, you... maintaining patient facing undergraduate medical education. So we're on the first slide, Andrew. All right, so I think I'm going to have to go into the slide presentation. I can't see you. If I if I click forward, can you see the next slide that follows? Um, Is that working? Has the next slide gone through? No. Um, right. Are you on dual monitors? I think you might be sharing your secondary monitor, possibly. Let me just cancel it and let me try again. Not a problem. Maybe just. So I normally get people to do the presentation for me. No, um, no, we, we did say at the beginning that there's a blurb just for people to be sympathetic. They're not they're not always easy uh, virtual events, but. OK, my PowerPoint is. Is on the screen. Is anything showing? Not at the moment. I'll tell you uh, what we could on. do. Let me, no, no, let me try again. Can we go with this? Can you see a slide? I can see a slide. It's whether it moves on or not is the key question. Ah, oh, yeah, that looks promising. Yeah, try that and then click onto the that, slide. Does that work? Perfect. That work? We're underway. All right, Over let's, to let's you. do that. OK, so apologies. Not particularly slick um, transition there from one presentation to the rest, but uh, uh, that's that's where it goes in the NHS sometimes with the the technology we have. Um, so I'm a um, associate medical director and a, a kidney specialist in Leeds. Um, and one of the issues that I was faced with when the pandemic struck was how do we continue to maintain medical student teaching? So the first wave hit us and we had to suspend medical student placements in March 2020. And we have um, uh, approximately 250, 260 medical students in each year and uh, different years will come through at different times to have their placements with us. So you can see that this had a big impact on what we were trying to do with our future uh, workforce, our future doctors. Our priority is within the trust to deliver safe patient care. So I started to explore what the possibilities for enabling us to provide remote learning. And I came across the Microsoft HoloLens as a possibility. So I've used this in its um, really its simplest form to deliver what we needed. And I think having seen what Shafi's presented, there's a whole lot more that can be done with it. And that's going to be exciting in itself as we move forward. But what have we done? Um, over this period of time. Well, we looked at the HoloLens and uh, we liked the look of it because it was hands-free, so that's good for infection prevention. And our infection prevention team um, helped us uh, review this and made sure that we could take it into the clinical area safely. And we've got a, a series of guidelines and protocols set up around this now. Um, we went through the information governance team and we got a tick from them because it uh, uses Teams, which is the preferred system of the NHS. It's encrypted. And as long as we use um, NHS.net accounts to join this whenever it's patient facing, then we're in line with our own information governance. The important thing here is that uh, you do have to set up a whole raft of um, protocols and, and guidelines around this to make sure everyone, understa everyone understands how you use this sort of technology, because it's not to be used lightly when you're working with uh, patients. Live streaming, well, this was great. Uh, we enabled us to use um, this with uh, patient face facing real time interaction uh, with the students as well. So when you wear the headset, you can actually uh, not only see the patient in front of you, but you can see the, uh, the students uh, real time. And that gives it an authenticity, which I think is really, really important. When I give them presentations before and I can't see who I'm presenting to, I find that difficult as a, as a lecturer. I do like to see people's faces and their reactions uh, to what I'm actually saying uh, when I'm teaching. So this is the HoloLens 2, and we've um, gone on now and bought uh, 12 HoloLens 2s, which we're using within the trust. So in terms of getting ready to use it, it took quite a lot of time to, to get familiar with the technology, to work through the protocols, to get the approvals within the trust. So importantly, you've got to optimize the use of the HoloLens in the clinical environments. 
It's important to understand that there's a noise cancelling microphone, which might be great if you're in the surgical environment. But if you're wanting to, to use this or, or, or if you're wanting to use this and discuss things with the wider audience around you, um, then that's 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 difficult. If you're wanting to pick up the patient talking to you, that doesn't happen with a noise cancelling microphone. It will only pick up your voice when you're speaking into it. Um, but we managed to work around that and we, we can use a USB microphone which is plugged into the back and that allows you then to pick up the surrounding environment. However, do you need to make sure that the surrounding environment is quiet enough? Because if you try and have these teaching sessions in a busy ward environment where the televisions are on, people are discussing things rather loudly in the bay next door, then that interferes and really can disrupt the, the teaching experience. The other thing that we, um, we discovered was that if you have a student who's doing, for example, the examination with the tutor wearing the hollow lens and is like the cameraman pointing the, the hollow lens at the student and talking to the other students who, are, who are, have joined the, uh, the team's um, event uh, distant um, on, the, on the headset, then the, um, the student who's uh, in the area in front of you can't actually hear uh, what the other students are saying. But we managed to work around this by using, a mo using the student's uh, mobile phone, putting the Microsoft Teams on the mobile phone, and then they connect through and join the session. And with an earpiece, they can also understand what's going on in the teaching session. The field of view on the headset uh, is something to be very aware of because the camera does not follow the eye. So when you're examining a patient, often you don't necessarily move your head down in an exaggerated fashion. You'll just cast your eyes down if you're looking at the hands, for example. Now, the headset won't necessarily see the hands if you were trying to show somebody what you were doing. So there is something there about learning how to move your head appropriately so it captures the, the field of view in terms of what you want the students to see. We also had a, a, a um, period of time where we were trying to, discuss, uh, try to decide whether it would be better if the tutor wore it or, or the students wore the headset. And we're doing some work around this uh, as we go forward um, within, the, uh, uh, within the trust. The other thing that's important to have is a battery pack because the HoloLens power source can run out after a few hours. And if you're running a, a consultation or a, uh, an event that runs for several hours, you want to make sure that the, uh, the system doesn't um, pack down on you during the middle of that teaching session. So just going back to preparation, we need to make sure that information governance would give us approval on this. Uh, they were happy for us to, to do this as long as we used NHS.net accounts. So this meant that we had to get all of our medical students that were going to be using the teaching onto NHS.net accounts, which is something that they wouldn't normally have. Um, so that created a whole, um, well, a, a whole amount of work that had to be carried out by the digital skills um, uh, team. Um, live streaming was fine. They didn't want us to record any sessions for the time being, although that's something that we will um, certainly work on as we go forward. And verbal consent of the patient was, was adequate um, for the sorts of teaching we were doing. Infection prevention and control, uh, they wanted to have a close look at this. The best way to engage with any of these teams was to bring them along to get a hollow lens on their head so they could actually understand what this all was about. And uh, they've given us the, uh, the uh, approvals to use it in COVID-19 hot and uh, cold areas now, if we so wish to. And that means that clinical teams can use it uh, in the COVID-19 areas if, if we wish to. We haven't done that as yet, um, but it's there if we do need to. And then importantly, the IT. The IT is essential to getting good images good audio, good high definition. We used the university Wi-Fi to start with, but we found this was patchy in different areas of the trust. And we did finally manage to get um, it connected onto the what we call the purple Wi-Fi, which is the best part of the NHS Wi-Fi. Um, that's the most robust part. And the images that we have now are absolutely fabulous in terms of uh, bringing the patient facing consultations to the audience at home. So this is one of our uh, medical students. This is Tobias uh, sitting in the bed, mocked up as a patient. Um, he works very hard as a fourth year medical student on his ESREP project during the summer in uh, developing a lot of this work, sorting out the, uh, the agreements with the uh, information governance, infection prevention teams, uh, sorting out the Wi-Fi and so on. And there's, uh, there's one of our um, technicians uh, on the, uh, the camera there. And that's the sort of view that you would see if you're looking through the HoloLens. Um, you would see the, the patients in front of you, and then you could bring other images around that and you could see um, other people that were, uh, that were coming in onto the, the, the hollow lens. So you can get that nice sort of interaction going on. This is where we bring augmented reality to the live streaming part of the um, teaching session. So we worked through um, with uh, the oncology team as one of the first teams. Um, we had a number of people come through to, to, to have demonstrations of the hollow lens. Um, some people uh, could immediately um, 
uh, recognized the importance of it and wanted to go forward and, and work with us in collaboration. Others hummed and hard and, and went away and we didn't hear anything else from them afterwards, although they're starting to come back to us now as they recognize this pandemic is going to be going on for a much longer period of time. So we work with the oncology placements. Here we have patients who are immunosuppress their immune systems, put them at a high risk of, of COVID-19. And we uh, brought back our fourth year medical students in July. And we wanted them to be able to uh, have remote teaching on the, uh, on the oncology wards. So we set up uh, by pre-consenting patients, identifying um, where, the, where the HoloLens could be used in quieter areas of the, of the ward. Uh, we had two clinicians at the bedside. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. One clinician interacting with the patient and one clinician wearing the hollow lens and um, also one clinician joining the session remotely on Microsoft Teams, whereby they could share appropriate clinical information with the medical students, such as blood results, scans, medications, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, this again was where we were bringing augmented reality to the uh, teaching session. And then the medical students connected through the Microsoft Teams. These were all being set up by our undergraduate team because they were acting as the guardians of these sessions to make sure that everybody joined on the appropriate NHS.net accounts. So here we can see a bed space in uh, our oncology wing. We see uh, one of our doctors there um, crouching down next to our patient. And we see uh, one of the other consultants standing on the side with a hollow lens who's filming the session with the students coming into the, the session. You can have up to 49 uh, students joining a session if you so wish. Uh, we usually have smaller groups than that. And we have one of our, our nursing colleagues uh, present as well. So we've been performing some evaluations of this. The, the clinicians find it favorable um, as long as they get some training in how to use the technology. It's not something you just pick off the shelf and know how to use it immediately. It's something whereby you need to uh, do some teaching um, so that people actually feel comfortable when they take it to the ward area. The medical students have been very positive, uh, particularly the session is, well, importantly, like any teaching, you've got to prepare your teaching session appropriately. Again, there's no point picking it up and try and run to the ward and, uh, and, and run a session without the preparation. And the patients, the feedback we've had from patients is that certainly they, they're very grateful that we've tried to reduce the, uh, the exposure of them to other, other people in their um, surroundings and uh, also very grateful that we continue to train our future doctors. So where are we using at the moment? Well, the number of use cases continues to grow. So in fourth year, with fourth year medical students, we're now using it in paediatrics. Um, the, the paediatrics placements, uh, the medical students were, were no longer able to go and meet the, uh, the, the patients in the clinic areas. So we've now started to use it there. In renal medicine, I've been using it to, um, uh, to, to take one medical student bedside to perform clinical examinations with the other medical students watching remotely and learning and the students have really enjoyed these sessions and they really enjoy watching one of their fellow medical students performing the examination and they can work their way through that um, as they watch it and the medical student who's performing the examination actually prefers that they haven't got three other medical students standing around the bedside watching them as they do this. With the second year medical students, we're just starting to, to roll this out. Um, our first and second years have not come back to campus and they're all at home. So we're going to rely on the HoloLens to perform clinical examination teaching for them. And here we'll actually have the clinician um, performing uh, a clinical examination with the students watching the, the clinician. And uh, we'll work on that and see how that works and evaluate uh, how best to, to continue with that teaching. And then with some of the first year medical students, they have projects and, and my wife's been working on a project. She's an anesthetist and they'd normally bring the students into the uh, operating room. Uh, they've had their first session with the students and they've managed to do an orientation of the department with the uh, showing them the equipment, the medications and everything. And they're, they're thinking about whether they now use the HoloLens for a simulation of an intubation uh, that they can use with the students. And I say the students are, are calling in from all around the country as they're not with us currently. Uh, and they really appreciate uh, this sort of um, the way in which we can bring uh, what we're what we're doing to them so they can get a real sense. It's not just something that's been watched uh, online. It's something that's real time. They can actually feel that uh, the authenticity of it. So what are my top tips um, for trying to use the HoloLens in particular for the way we've used it? You've got to make sure you've got information governance, infection prevention control on side. You've got to work out you've got a good internet connection. Otherwise, the session will just die. It, it, it's, it's the worst thing that can happen. It's a bit like me trying to set my slides up at the beginning. You're trying to set something up. Everyone starts twiddling their thumbs and wondering what's happening. 
Um, you've got to demonstrate the technology to a, war, a wide number of people for them to actually understand what it's about, to get interested. Uh, you've got to train the tutors. You've got to train the, the students. You've got to have a user agreement. This is important so the students understand um, what, their, what their responsibilities are in terms of viewing patient-facing consultations from home. You cannot do this in a library. You cannot do this with somebody wandering into the uh, room where you're, where you're viewing this. So we have to have very clear advice to the students. Surrounding staff need to know what's going on. They may not want to be uh, uh, live streamed somewhere when you're on the ward area. You need a quiet surrounding. The patient, inf the patient needs information and consent, and you need to perform some evaluation to understand what is what's happening. Andrew, so I'm just going to, sorry, Andrew, I'm just going to interrupt because yep. we are pushed for time now. We've got one more guest speaker before we we, we arrive. So if I could just give you a quick 30 second kind of final yep. conclusion, that'd be that'd be brilliant. Yep. Okay. Well, that was my conclusion. So we'll skip through that. Um, the future. So I think it's really important to um, uh, increase the opportunities for use cases. I think as familiarity grows, there will be uh, more need for this. I think uh, we're looking forward to exploring the mixed reality. I think it's important to collaborate and we're starting to see that more and more. And I think really important for those maybe on the call, industry needs to engage and partner with the academics and the clinicians up front at the beginning to develop the appropriate digital tools and determine whether they'll work well. I don't think you should be developing these and then presenting them to us as a fait accompli and us trying to force them into areas where, where we find it hard to, to use them. I think it's about that up front, uh, getting together and understanding how we best develop them. Thank you. Hey. Excellent. Thank you for that. That is that is really, really kind of you to do that presentation and, and great to share your learning. I think lots of people's ears will have pricked up with that learning. And um, as some of the it said in the chat, we did build a little bit of slack in just in terms of the agenda, but we're, we're running out of that slack now. So just before we go into our, our last speaker before the breakout rooms, we're going to post the breakout rooms in the chat. Join those that you find most interesting. And um, we have got some facilitators in that room that will have to keep people to time. So we've allowed, you know, pitches to be sort of seven seven or eight minutes to just allow a bit of that transition time and um, but but please just stay with us for final 10 minutes to listen to ryan matthew consultant neurosurgeon at leeds and also part of the center for immersive technology in leeds so if i can hand over to you please ryan is ryan on mute hi ryan good there we hey. go just uh bringing up my talk thank you yeah so we are we are right on the edge of our time please ryan if that's okay so we're going to start at 10 to for our breakout sessions um yeah. but but yes thank you for joining us i'm really looking forward to this presentation no problem so uh thanks pete and to everybody for listening um as yeah. uh, as introduced my name is ryan matthew i'm a consultant neurosurgeon at leeds and uh, an academic at the University of Leeds. Um, and I'm also the health feed lead for the Center for Immersive Technologies, uh, which makes my email signature very long, but uh, hopefully you'll understand a little bit more about our center. I think the first two talks have been really fascinating and I know both Andy and Shafi well, so they won't uh, mind me saying that they're really at two ends of a spectrum. Shafi's a fantastic innovator, futurist, really at the cutting edge of what technology is capable of doing. And Andy's a very fantastic pragmatist. He, he really understands the mechanisms by which to get these things into actual practice, make a difference on the ground, sort of on the day to day challenges, really. And, and I think this is fundamental to where the Centre for Immersive Technologies lies, because we're really at the heart of this type of collaboration. We want to be the center that facilitates innovation, allows industry to come to us and, and we can show them the very cutting edge of technology. But then we also have this access to this fantastic clinical environment, pragmatists such as Andy uh, and giving you, you real on the ground tips and tricks about how to implement some of this technology. And I think that's very important for some of our industrial partners, many of whom approach us and are on that iceberg that they're, they're really at the cutting edge of where their r and i development budgets are, are running out and what they need is a very rapid understanding of what it takes to get this into practice um, and into a, a into a healthcare system which is as andy has shown very clearly is not always easy to navigate i want to take you on a very quick tour through this talk because really it's not about the talk it's about your understanding of CFIT and where we can apply that. Um, a bit of blue sky thinking, first of all. 
Imagine the scene. I, I walk into theatre and my patient's asleep. I'm ready to perform this surgery. I look across and I see some of our amazing neuronavigation technology. It's segmented the tumour. The machine learning algorithms are showing me where the important structures are near this tumour. I can see the tractography. I can see that this patient has speech, movement and sensation right next to their brain tumour. I look again at the patient and I'm reminded this is a young family, a young man with a, with, with a job, with all his aspirations and dreams, and I'm having to take this tumour out. I put on my glasses and instantly when I look at his head, I see things that are actually not real. They're augmenting my experience. They're really giving me that insight into the challenges, but also making everything so much safer. I perform the surgery and thankfully it's a good outcome and the tumour's removed. What's really remarkable about all this technology is I'm yet to leave my house and I'm in my pyjamas. And this really, as, as Shafi said, is not science fiction. Much of this technology exists, but we are a group of con converts. We know that much of this technology exists. How do we actually get this? into a healthcare system and where do you provide the evidence for it? So the Centre for Immersive Technologies was really born out of this concept that immersive technologies will be such a, a heart of our technological future. We see ourselves very much as part of the digital triangle at Leeds and this is amalgamating big data with machine learning approaches and amalgamating that with immersive technologies. So this digital triangle concept is really fundamental to the way we operate. And again, CFIT aims to connect these partners. So CFIT should be a conduit to the wider academic offering we have at Leeds, uh, which connects these and of course beyond. All of this sits in the Leeds city region which we are uh, very proud to have been uh, quoted in because our university really represents uh, this drive and push towards developing immersive technology and, and being at the heart of that. And we really see ourselves as, uh, as a leader amongst the Russell Group universities in this. Some examples of our partners, we have multiple industrial partners, and I can't again re-emphasize what both Shafi and um, Andy have said about engaging with us early. There is a there is a, a point at which you need to engage. I mean, coming to us with, with a great idea and, and zero idea of how to develop that is not always helpful, but actually coming to us with the final product and asking a bunch of clinicians to trial it also can have its challenges because if somebody turns around and says, I wish you'd come to us halfway through this process and we could have given you much better advice. So, so industry is a tricky one. Um, we love working with industry. We have very, very good partnerships with our industrial partners. And, um, you know, if we can't help, we'll almost certainly know somebody who can. We're also well tied in with the Wolfson Centre for Applied Health Research. And this brings one of the largest communities, and many of you will be aware through mainstream media of the project Born in Bradford, which is uh, uh, the, the, one of the largest studies ever longitudinally. Um, and again, these are healthcare populations that we work with. Obviously, Ryan, sorry, sorry, Ryan, just to interrupt, I can see people are leaving. I mean, it is coming up to, you know, last 30 seconds before 10 to. Um, so, so sorry, we're slightly overrun, but people will be leaving for the event. Um, but it, but it's great. I mean, if you could just wrap up, actually, because yeah, I think, like up, you yeah. said, connection, you know. And, yes. and, and, uh, yeah. So, as I said, multiple projects that we're involved with. And this is probably the most important slide. How can we help? So we really are a collaboration hub. The main thing we bring is this academic and research expertise. So we need evidence that this stuff works. And, and if we're going to get big partners and governments to invest in this, we're really going to need to develop that evidence. We also have obvious access to the clinical environments. And one example of a big uh, report that we're about to release is the Immersive Collaborative Report, which uh, will circulate through. And then the last slide, and probably one of the most important, is just our contact details. So please do follow us on Twitter. There isn't a decent talk without a Twitter handle at the end. And also our email address there, um, immersivetech at leeds.ac.uk, which again, I'm sure Pete would, um, Pete would. But please do reach out to us. I hope it's given you a flavour of what we do at CFIT. And, um, uh, more information is available.
Very kind of you, Ryan. And as I said, please, please stay with us if you can spare the time today. Do connect and, and definitely let's let's all connect after this event, which is, is one of the aims. So without further ado, we are on, on, on time to split out into our breakout rooms. I'm, I'm going to be facilitating one of those, which is why I was, um, you know, why, why I need to stick to time. But but thank you to all of our uh, presenters so far in this first part. You know, this is just the first part of the meeting. We've got some great guest speakers. Um, so without further ado, please go and check out some breakout rooms and, and connect please with people. Everyone, you should see the links for the breakout rooms in the chat. If you are missing any of the links, do go to the chat, copy and paste those into a new browser. Please may I ask where the chat is? Yeah, if you just click on the, um, you should see an icon at the top of the screen with a little speech bubble. You click on that. It's, yeah, it's not showing. I'm the same. It's Nicholas Stack from Northeast Links Council. I'm very used to using Teams and I can't find the chat either. No, I certainly don't have one. Um, there's, there's no... Um, I've clicked on the three no, dots more actions as well and it's, it's not showing. Yeah, it should the speech bubble should be on the left of those three dots. It's not there now. Not no, for me now. Not for okay. me either. Um, just give me your no, names and me. I'll try and dig out your emails and send you the um, links. Did you get the links to, to the programme at all? Yes. I, I don't yes. know who's looking, but uh, just to let you know, the team links for the, the rooms are in the chat function. The PDF, the PDF programme has all the links to the um, breakout sessions in it as well. On, okay, page, on page three, you should find all the links in a table to the breakout rooms um, Thank you. in there. And they're also on page five at the bottom of each, each column for the rooms. Um, if anybody hasn't got the program and can't see the chat, um, do let me know and I can email you um, links to breakout rooms. Does that apply to anyone? Uh, uh. Tracy, is that you who's struggling with the links? Found it. 